the Old Testament prophet Daniel, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Daniel, the 10th chapter, will be beginning at verse 1. And as is our custom, we'll stand in honor of the reading of God's Word today. And I shall read the King James Version this morning, this afternoon. Daniel chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, and the word of the Lord reads, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. I just got for half a second. Did you see what it just said there? It said that there was something that was shown to Daniel that was true, but the time appointed was long. Sometimes God will show you a promise. He'll show you something He wants to do, but it takes a long time getting there. It doesn't just happen overnight. And it says, And he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. Verse 2, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Finitel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphrates, his body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lumps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Again, I'm going to stop for a moment. People wonder what it is when people are slain in the spirit. This is an example of someone being slain in the spirit. <laughs> Daniel was experiencing something in the spirit, but it had a physical reaction in him that caused him, he said, so that no strength remained in him. And he literally just collapsed on the floor. Now in his case, he fell forward, not back. And he fell on his face, okay? But this is just one of many biblical examples of such things occurring. Verse 10, And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palm of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. 
Daniel chapter 10 verses 1 through 13 is what we have just read. Master, we ask today that you would put your blessing and your anointing upon your word this hour. Help us to glean from this word of exhortation, God, that which you would have us to walk away from this place grieving. Master, today grant us a faith that we might be a people of faith to believe you for great things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. This is one of the greatest examples in the scriptures. <laughs> it's one of the most wonderful examples in the scriptures of something that we all experience in life that none of us like, but we all experience it. And that is when you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and the answer never seems to come. The Bible said that Daniel wanted something from God and he wanted it bad and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed for this understanding to come concerning some things that God had revealed to him. And Daniel prayed and he prayed and he prayed and yet he was not able to find what he wanted. He was not able to attain what he desired. And finally, on the 24th day of this month, a man appeared to him that was obviously nothing less than an angel from God. And the angel of God appeared to Daniel. But I love the message that this angel spoke to Daniel that day because he's speaking the same message to you and I today. In verse 12, the angel speaks to Daniel and says, Hear not, Daniel! For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. Hallelujah. I want you to know today, from the first time you pray, God hears what you've got to say. Hallelujah. He hears you pray from the very first moment it crosses your lips. Don't ever think that God is not attentive, that he is not mindful to the prayers of his people. Oh, yes, he is. Uh, even the angel declared to Daniel, from the very first day, God heard you. And that's why I'm here today. But then here's the portion of the equation that we don't understand a lot of times. But it's important that we understand it. Because in verse 13, the angel of God proceeds to declare to Daniel, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. That's twenty-one days or three weeks. He said, For three weeks the prince of Persia. Now some people reading this might think, that the angel of God was speaking of a Saddam Hussein, who is today a prince of Persia, as it were. But he's not talking about a natural leader in the natural world, but what he was saying was that the enemy of our soul has a very, very specific, very carefully organized spiritual realm and that spiritual realm seeks to hinder everything good that God would send your way. Amen. Everything good, God wants all good things for you. But every time he tries to ship them, there's somebody wanting to hijack the truck. And we've got to remember today, children, when we pray and as we are asking God for things and, and we're wondering why the answer doesn't seem to come. Ephesians 6 and 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Who you are wrestling with in hell, my friend, is not your God, but your enemy. <laughs> Amen. Prayer is a exercise in warfare. And a lot of times we forget that. We think about the Lord Jesus in the in the uh, the garden of Gethsemane praying. The Bible said until his sweat became as blood. 
obviously he was struggling with and fighting with emotions and feelings, and he began to experience something so great that his blood vessels began to pump in his forehead. That's why Paul the Apostle said, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You see, a lot of times we fall into a, a pattern of self-pity and we begin to pity our situation and pity ourselves and all woe with us because of what we're experiencing and what we're going through. And Paul would remind us, there's not a one of us that in the course of struggling in prayer, in the course of struggling in the spirit realm, has ever gotten to the place where blood was being poured out from our body. Amen. You know, we get so caught up in our concerns. They're so great. Sometimes we lose sight of all the provision that God has made for us, all the extra prayer that God has given us. We could be homeless out on the street, not having anybody to support us or help us, when instead we have a place to live, we have clothes on our back, we have food to eat. Honey, those are prayers that God is answering today that you prayed years ago. Lord, in my old age, don't ever let me be uh, abandoned by my children. Don't let me be abandoned. Don't let me not have what I need in, in a time of trouble. And God said, fine, I'll make sure that never happens. And it happens. Amen. You see, we've got to remember... Because I'm going to tell you, one of the things that Satan loves the most, he loves to hinder, I like to call it what God's glory package, you know. He likes to hinder God's glory package from arriving angelic express. He likes to hinder it, and then he likes to sit back and watch God's people begin to grumble, mumble, and complain. Because what he does, what he has just accomplished is, he has just accomplished causing your faith to waver. Amen. That's what he's just accomplished. He's just accomplished causing your faith to fail. And the Bible tells us that without faith it is impossible to please him. And the devil just revels in being able to make God's people think begin to waver. He just tickles him to hear you bring accusation against God. Don't you remember the story of Job? He said, if you were to lift the hedge that you placed around Job of protection, if you were to lift up that hedge, he said, he'd sooner curse you than say, look at you, God. See, Satan was so sure that Job was just like every other believer in the church. He was so sure that Job was just like everybody else in God's fellowship that if things went bad enough, he eventually turned on God and cursed him. Hmm. Oh, but you know what, Job? <laughs> Job was a character. Job was something different. He wasn't like all the other believers in the church. Hallelujah. He wasn't even like me. I wish I was more like Job. Amen. I tell you what, Job got to the place where in Job chapter 13 and verse 15, he was having a conversation with some folks who were basically saying to him, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job turns around and declares to them, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Hallelujah. But I will maintain my own way before him. But even if it kills me, I'm going to trust him because he knows what he's doing. He said, but I know that I'm going to maintain my way before him. I'm going to do what's right regardless. Hallelujah. Job had his foot on the rock, as the old song said, and his mind made up. Though I walk through the lonesome valley, though I drink from the dinner cup, when the devil comes to knock and offering me an easy way, I'm going to look him right square in the eye. And this is what I'll say. I've got my foot on the rock. Hallelujah. For though he slay me, yet 
Your life trusts Him. Oh, children, don't you know God wants people so full of faith that they're able to know in the darkest of circumstances, though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. Amen. In Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us a parable that dealt with the issue of praying through. That's an old-fashioned Pentecostal term, praying through. And that's what I'm calling my message today, praying through. And in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, this beautiful parable appears concerning persistence. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men are always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. That is an interesting statement to tap on to the end of that parable. But there was a reason for Jesus placing this tag on the end of that parable because the entire issue surrounding our willingness to keep going to God with our petition, to keep going to God with our needs, the entire issue at hand, my friend, is our faith. I've said it before, I believe, and I'll probably say it many times, but I remember a time when there were some in the, the faith movement, as it's called, here in America. I remember a time when there were some like Kenneth Copeland and some of those who used to teach that if you ask God for something twice, you didn't believe in for it the first time. You should only ask once and then believe him and claim it and yada, yada, yada. That is garbage and trash. And the, the parable that I just read to you was the Lord himself illustrating the need sometimes to keep going before God, to keep pressing in, to keep praying, to keep asking, to keep believing. Because every time you do that, it's like exercising a muscle and you grow stronger and stronger in faith. And the greater the resistance, the more powerful you become. Hallelujah. And when you exercise that faith muscle glory to God, the longer the devil keeps it from you, the greater that your faith increases. And by the time you're done, your faith will be so great that he will be able to keep anything from you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. The ultimate end of our patience is Hey, hallelujah. That's the ultimate goal in our life that God has set for us, that we would have faith in our life to believe Him, to trust Him. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 7 reads, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith Work with patience. He said, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. Do you remember when I said the word perfect in the original Greek means, means complete? That's exactly what he said. He said that you may be perfect and entire or complete. He said, Let, let patience have 
a perfect work so that you can be complete. He said, wanting nothing. Then he says in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I remember as a young man in ministry when I was going through my internship and then when I started my first church at the age of 18 years old, my district overseer and I had a lot of differences between us, Brother Carver and I. We had a lot of differences between us. We didn't, we didn't get along poorly, but we didn't get along as well as we could have. And uh, I remember when I was pastoring my first church there and when a father said to me one day, I believe we're headed out to camp meeting, and he said, Chuck, I have to tell you one thing, son. He said, I have known men in ministry for 40 and 50 years that do not have the wisdom that you have, and you're not but 18 years old. He said, it's amazing to me, absolutely floors me. He said, I've seen you, have, I've seen you deal with circumstances in your local church that would have thrown a lot of pastors for a major loop. That might have even caused their church to break up, or might have caused the whole thing to go down the drain. He said, but you have this incredible God-given wisdom. And he said, son, it's amazing to me the capacity for wisdom that you have. And that was a great compliment. And I responded to him at that time by saying, brother, did not the apostle promise her that if any man desires wisdom, let him ask of God, and God would give it liberally. Isn't that what it says? Yes, it is. I said, well, growing up as a kid, my grandmother used to complain about a young pastor that we had, Brother Dick Babcock. And all the time, I kept hearing her say, all the time, all the time, oh, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom. He didn't lack wisdom, he lacked numbers on his license. The age wasn't high enough for her. That was really where the problem was. And I said, brother, I heard that my whole life growing up and, and being a young preacher. I said, when God called me to preach, I began to pray, God give me wisdom. Because I don't ever want somebody to talk about me the way my grandmother does about Brother Babcock. Amen. And Brother Papa said, well, God surely answered your prayer, boy. Because here you are, 18 years old. He said, you've got enough wisdom. He said, I tell you, I know men in their 50s and 60s that haven't got the wisdom you've got in ministry. So you see, God does answer prayer. He does, he does do what he says he'll do. He does, he does indeed, by all means, uh, keep his word. But now listen, James said, if any man likes like things, uh, and like wisdom, let him ask of God. But now listen, he says, but let him or her ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he or she shall receive anything of the Lord. It is imperative when we ask God for something that we believe He's going to give it. It doesn't matter how long it takes to get here, Mother. Lord, I know you're going to do it, but I'm just asking again. The angel come told me, like he told Daniel, from the first time I prayed, God, you heard me. But Lord, the devil's up there trying to hinder my blessing till I'm asking all over again. And I'll tell you, in, in, uh, in the way of spiritual warfare, children, there's something else you need to know. You need to know when you pray, it doesn't hurt sometimes to talk to the devil, amen. And let him know, get your hands up off my blessing, hallelujah. I've got a pocket coming from glory, and I want you to let go of it. Hallelujah. You'd be amazed. I have, there have been times in my ministry that I was, we were desperately in need of financial miracles and what have you. 
and I prayed and I prayed, and it never seemed like it was going to come. And all of a sudden I said, you know what? I'm talking to the wrong person. That's the problem. Because I know my father, and my father does what he says he'll do. And I believe that he's going to do it, and therefore I'm sure he must have already done it. So if I'm sure that he's already done it, then obviously the one I need to talk to is the enemy of my soul. And let him know, devil, get your hands up, my blessing. In Jesus' name. And I guarantee you, I'm not kidding, I have done that and within a matter of days, suddenly had a major miracle come about financially. And I'm sitting there saying, Lord, why didn't I do that sooner? <laughs> Amen. You see? Why didn't I do that sooner? Why didn't I address the devil sooner? Because the angel that came to Daniel said, Daniel, I'm here for you, but I was hindered. Well, put out in God. He's already sent the angel. Now it's time to talk with the prince of Persia. Jesus said, I've given you authority over all unclean spirits and over every unclean thing. He said, all power is given unto you in my name. Hallelujah. You're going to cast out devils of all children. It's about time we learn that we have the power of the people of God to call the devil a liar and call it out by name and tell him to let go of our blessings. Amen. I've got an answer to prayer. Devil that I know God must surely have already sent. See, that's how real my faith is, brother. I know that God must have already sent. So that means you're tying up the works. So it's time for you to let go of my blessing. Amen. Woo! Woo! My Lord, well, this was a short message, I told you. That's going to be a long one. But the Lord wants you to know from the first time you pray, He says, I hear. But don't forget, there's another aspect to this thing. It's called spiritual warfare. It's not just about prayer, it's about spiritual warfare. And when you're praying and asking God, don't come back to Him with accusation. Well, Lord, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do it? Honey, He's already started the works. He's already started the process. Everything's already in motion. It ain't God that's holding up the show. Amen. It's the enemy that's holding up the show. But the good thing about that is you have power over the enemy. My Bible tells me in Daniel, what we just read today, that it was Michael, one of the chief princes. Who is Michael? One of God's archangels who came to help me, he said. Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. But you know, I read in the Bible where Michael contended with Satan over the body of Moses. Do you remember that story? And the scripture said that he contended with Satan over the body of Moses. The enemy tried to hinder Michael from carrying out what God had sent him to do in retrieving the body of Moses. And the scripture said that Michael had to say, The Lord rebuked me because Michael doesn't have the power or the authority in Jesus' name that his church has right now. We don't have to say, Oh, the Lord rebuked me. No, we can say, I'll rebuke you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory. See, the angels don't have that authority. So when your blessing is delayed, talk to the devil about it. Because you're the one with the authority to tie his hands and feet and loose your blessing on its way. Oh, amen. Would you stand up with me? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I told you it'd be a, a fairly short message today. Word of exhortation. Woo, woo. Well, amen. I hope, I hope it's a, that this message proves the blessing, but 
A lot of people, because so many people don't understand it. It's just a simple principle. It really is. But there's a spiritual war going on here. You can't blame God. God may very well have already sent your package. And it's tied up in transit. So we need to quit bringing accusation against our God, which in turn just glorifies the devil of the storm. Amen. He gets the biggest kick. Because he knows that he's the one tying up the show to begin with. And then when we bring accusation against God about it, that just tickles the devil to no end. Makes him so happy. Amen. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for every day of life that we have. But we thank you most of all for another Sunday, another opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence, to experience your word. It's not just hear it, God, but experience it. Because every time the word of the Lord is preached under that great apostolic anointing, Lord, we experience something new and fresh deep within our breast and deep within our person. Lord, stir up within us this hour the mighty warrior that's able to go against the enemy in prayer. God is able to take an authoritative stand and let him know, I'm a child of God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to loose my blessing and let it go. Master, we know today there are many needs in this church, for Emily, for Mom, for so many today. And we just ask God that you would minister to each and every one of these needs. The Lord, right now, we believe you're already ministering. We believe the answer is already on its way. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak to every hindering spirit that would come against the higher knowledge of a living God, every demonic power from hell that would resist to uh, allowing the healing virtue of our God to flow in Emily's body. In the name of Jesus, we find it upon the authority of God's word, and we cast it all death down. And Master, on behalf of every other situation, we're presented in this little fellowship of people. We're binding every unclean spirit, God, that will try to hinder uh, what you're trying to do in our lives. And bringing us the blessing and the life more abundant that you've promised. Devil, you're a liar. You're the father of lies. Our God has never lied to us and he never will. We claim the promise, we believe the promise, we receive the promise, now let go of the promise. In the name of our God, in Jesus' name. The Master, we ask all this today, in the wonderful name of our Savior and our Lord, and our soon coming King, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen.